What is going on with multifamily properties these days? Rent growth has slowed while expenses have soared. What are investors and syndicators doing to deal with this? And have prices of multifamily properties come down enough to offset all these increased expenses along with the slowdown in rent growth? I'm Kathy Fedke. Welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fedke, the real estate investor's resource. Our guest today, Gary Lipsky, is the president of Break of Day Capital, a company that has acquired 3,200 apartment units valued at over $280 million. He's also the author of a new book, Invest Smart, Spotting Red Flags in Real Estate Syndications. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show to share some of the struggles that multifamily operators are facing today, along with looking at some opportunities for the future. Gary, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kathy. I'm really excited to be on. Well, it's so timely for a few reasons. You have a new book coming out, and also multifamily is, uh, there's a lot going on there, right? Our our audience is primarily invested in one to four units, but I'm sure we have multifamily investors listening. Uh, some have got caught into some bad deals over the last few years, and and some haven't. So let's start with kind of what you're seeing out there today. Yeah, so you're definitely seeing um, the multifamily uh, market is huge. So really, right. the, more of the problem focuses on on syndicated deals. You know, uh, a lot of people have mm-hmm. jumped into the industry in the last uh, ten years, riding a wave. I've certainly ridden a wave uh, as well, and a lot of those deals are are hurting right now because of high leverage, floating debt, um, and on top of that, you're having increased a cost that no one could have underwritten for. So insurance costs that um, not going up 5 or 10%, but going up 25 50 75%, which is huge. It blows your performance out of the water. Yeah. Real estate taxes have gone up. Other expenses have gone up. You're having uh, certainly of late uh, lower occupancy. Um, other expenses too, and and even some negative rent growth in some places. So you're having like a perfect storm where people are really, really hurting right now. Yeah. No, I mean, you said it all. You've got a time when, you know, a lot of this could be predicted and a lot of it couldn't have been predicted. But let's talk about the things that could have been predicted. Uh, for one, with multifamily, it's a little bit easier to gauge what's coming online because you can't build an apartment overnight. It takes years. So people should kind of have an idea of what what the supply side will be like. Is there a lot more coming on? And we've known for a few years that there was a lot of new supply coming on. When there's more supply, rents go down. Now, our listeners who are renters are probably like, yeah, this is this is great. This is a time for renters to get to kind of take a breather because in many areas, rents have come down or have held steady. Um, so that that's one one thing. What are your thoughts on that? What would you say that was fairly predictable? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you could you could see so um, uh, in Phoenix market, you'll there's like forty thousand permits, and there's a huge drop off um, that you know they haven't been building in the last year because of interest rates uh, being so high and the cost to build is is it, it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. So they're predicting you know two. 2025, 26 to really see uh, a jump in in occupancy and rental rates because of this kind of cliff falling off. So you could that that's a surefire way going back years of, of predicting where where are they building, um, how many units are coming on board, and and I'll, and you could you could check out the absorption rate of what they predict, but but certainly that's going to have a huge effect. Yeah, and you are in the Phoenix area, but you kind of avoided some of that, right, in your planning. Yeah, you know, we we kind of shifted years ago to Tucson where they don't build nearly as much. Uh, it didn't have such hyper growth. And so we didn't have um, negative um, rental rates and, um, and a huge occupancy dip. We had a little dip, but not nearly where you're going to have in a, a Phoenix uh, an Austin, uh, to some extent, Dallas, and some markets in Florida as well, where things really went went backwards quite a, quite a bit because of this um, building boom. In terms of, of rent rental growth, 
Right, right. Yeah. So so the main cities are what you just said, Phoenix, Dallas, Austin. What about Nashville? Uh, yeah, Nashville, absolutely. Um, you're going to see that um, uh, Jacksonville, Orlando, I think Tampa as well. Um, so the, um, the the markets that had exponential growth for a while now really jump backwards. And uh, like any any business, any market, there's going to be ebbs and flows. Um, mm -hmm. So you just have to have that kind of longer term debt versus the bridge floating debt where that's where you're going to run into trouble because you've got to be in and out in a very short period of time. And there's a lot of variables that will affect your, um, uh, your mortgage payment. So that's the second thing you could predict is your, you know, your rate, right? At least your rate, because uh, could you just explain for our audience what floating rate debt is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's a floor um, that uh, that people pay plus uh, a SOFR rate. Um, so you add these two numbers together. And so um, a floating rate will change, you know, as interest rates go up, your, your, your spread goes up. And so now you're instead of maybe when you, when you um, got the deal on the contract, you're paying six and a half percent. And now you could be paying eight and a half, nine percent. Now there are ways to mitigate that by buying a rate cap, but, most likely um, that rate cap goes up uh, higher year two, year three. So if you had a rate cap at, at, at seven and your, and your rate was seven and a half, you'd only pay up to 7% and, and um, whoever you did the rate cap uh, with, they would cover the spread, um, which is a nice uh, protective gap. But over time, that rate is going to keep going up and up if the rates keep going up and it went higher and longer than anyone predicted um, so it's, it's caused a lot of pain for people. And, and certainly I have a, a deal or two, or I've got, I'm paying a lot more interest than I, I predicted, you know, un unfortunately, but, um, yeah. you're, you're seeing capital calls for on, on some deals and, um, some deals that have gone under actually. And, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not great for the, for the investor that, um, put in their hard earned money into these deals. Yeah, for sure. So for, for our listeners who either were passive investors or have been thinking about multifamily, these are terms that are really important to understand. It's a different business. It's a completely different business than one to four unit. Uh, the debt structure is different. The way you call these things floating rate debt, we just call adjustable rate, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's what it is. It's just rates that change. Um, depending on what the short-term interest rates are. And we all know that those short-term interest rates have gone up. Now, in the one to four unit world, most people are on fixed rates. So they're not feeling any of this pain in terms of that. Buyers are because rates have gone up. But people who have a 30-year fixed rate debt that's in the two, three, four percent, they're they're feeling none of this. But adjustable rates obviously are. And would you say that most multifamily, most commercial property is on floating rate debt? Um, uh, a, a significant portion, absolutely, and it's it's more of the newer buyers that were chasing these deals. You know, cap rates are compressing; the cost to buy these deals went up. And if the banks are, you know, giving you eighty five percent, ninety percent leverage, they were using that to to buy more deals. Um, and so you've got a very frothy market. And for those that have been doing this a lot longer, we're more patient typically, and we're waiting for cap rates uh, to come down and, and, and some of the froth to, to, to come off and, and just, just be, be patient. Because if you're buying in 2022, um, most likely you overpaid for your deal. Yeah, yeah. So to um, to kind of come back to the theme of what could have been maybe known and what people going into it now can look for is supply. Supply and demand, of course, find out where the new supply is coming in. Uh, it should be known well in advance in what areas. Uh, and, and when we say a city like Dallas, Dallas is huge. So which areas of Dallas had all that new supply and which areas did not? Because we, we're investing on the outskirts of, of Dallas where there isn't a lot of supply. Uh, so, you know, really honing in on that. And how, how do you find that out? How do you find out where that supply is coming in? Yeah. I mean, that, that data is, is, is out there because they have to, uh, 
to apply for a permit. So you could check with the permanent office, you could check uh, city data. So there are places to get that information. Um, so it's not, it's not hidden information uh, where some states do have if you're looking for pricing on deals and whatnot, it's a, a non-disclosure state. That's a that's a whole nother thing. But this information is out there and is easily attainable. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so these are things to look into: is really understanding the supply, the rate, the term of the loan. So we know it's a uh, maybe an adjustable rate. You need to know what those terms are, whether you're buying the deal or investing in the deal. And then you said something called the rate cap. And a lot of people don't really know what that is, but basically it's insurance. It's like, hey, this is an adjustable rate, but if you pay this amount of money, um, it's going to be capped and the insurance company is going to pay that difference. However, those rate cuts also, I mean, rate caps have a term as well and expire. So this one of the pain points, in addition to what you said, insurance going up and, you know, um, interest rates going up. So the cost of debt going up, um, you've got these rate caps expiring and people who want to buy a new insurance policy, they're paying what, like, like more than double. Absolutely. I mean, if you have a big deal, I mean, you could be paying a million dollars or more after you even bought it. Um, and so most syndicators don't have a million dollars sitting, uh, you know, on the sideline waiting to put this in. So they're going to have to do a capital call to get a new uh, a rate cap uh, that the lender is requiring or try to find another loan that is fixed and doesn't require it. So there's a lot of maneuvering going on. And um, uh, lenders have been working with some of the operators, but certainly kicking the the can down the road um, to dealing with these these issues that are uh, a problem on, on, on a lot of deals out there. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this. Back when interest rates were at two or three percent, made a lot of sense to have a rate cap. Today, we know that the Fed is pivoting. They're going they're talking about cutting rates, which will um, which will affect the multifamily industry in a positive way, right? Finally, rates will hopefully be coming down. Would you still buy, spend a million dollars on a rate cap knowing this? No, not now, because um, there are different uh, options available where you, you didn't have it maybe six months ago, even three months ago. I mean, we've seen uh, on a deal I'm looking at now, the rate come down uh, one, one percentage point, so 100 bips. In, in six weeks time. So that's huge difference. So um, there's a lot more options out there uh, that people can use and maybe they go into agency debt, um, which is backed by the, the federal government. And, and, and it's gonna be more longer term and not, not short term with the, with the floating debt, but then you don't have to buy a, a, a rate cap. With insurance, do you think this, obviously, and I, I guess you could perhaps have predicted insurance rates going up with the number of storms that have been increasing and the climate change issues that we're facing. I suppose with really, really conservative underwriting, one could see that coming. Uh, but most people did not. And they are dealing with really high insurance rates. Do you think moving forward that's going to continue or do you think we've kind of reached the height of this, these insurance increases? So uh, on a deal in Tucson recently, um, our insurance jumped uh, like 40 percent and and we don't have any of these natural disasters. That's why they, they bought they mm -hmm. build billion dollar, multi-billion dollar chip factories in Arizona. And so obviously I fell off my chair when I saw that increase. And, and <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was like, what the heck? That could really blow up a deal. And. Yeah. You know, they said crime rate kind of increase and 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 we're like we haven't had any crime on that property. Coincidentally, on a nicer property that we own, not too far from there, we've had a little bit more crime, but on this property there there had been no crime and so we really pushed back, but you know, we, there wasn't any solution. We had to to bite it and and pay the 40% increase unfortunately and yeah, that was yeah. completely surprising for us. Um and and so now, yeah, any any if we deal going forward and all of our current deals, we're a lot allocating not just 10 percent, but a, a much bigger increase because of that. Yeah, that seems to be what we're hearing universally is 
uh, the storms may not be affecting your market or your property, but it's the same insurance company and they're feeling the pain and they're going to charge you. They're going to spread it out amongst all properties, whether you're in that danger zone or not. So sorry to hear that. That's, that's tough. That's one of the things that's always scared me about multifamily. As you know, you know, we've talked about doing deals together and I just got to back out at the last minute because I've, I've had my own pain with two multifamily properties, but also when you feel pain, you feel it a hundred X what I feel, <laughs> right? Yeah. Cause I might have a property that goes up with insurance, but you know, I, I feel like the government's really a little bit more uh, incentivized to help one to four unit you know, people versus multifamily they see as, oh, those are business people, you know, they can, they can handle the pain. What they don't see is that behind it are individuals, right? You know, in your syndications, you've just got normal people. Obviously they've got to be accredited, but accredited doesn't mean what it used to mean today. It's, it's people just trying to create a retirement for themselves, investing in these passive deals and, um, and really taking on the burden that maybe they shouldn't have to. It's, it's, it's hard to watch. It's so painful to see what's happening to multifamily. Do you, with all this said, what are the upsides? I mean, why would someone continue to invest today? Well, the beauty of multifamily. So if you had a one person, one person not paying rent on a, on, let's say a four unit, your uh, occupancy is now 75%. If I had one person not paying rent on a hundred unit, I'm at 99% occupied. So there's tremendous economies of scale. Mm -hmm. um, also with the bigger properties, you get professional property management. Um, so I've got, you know, on let's say a hundred unit, I've got a full-time maintenance person on site, a full-time uh, property management person on, on, on site. I get to utilize um, all of the data from the property management company in that region. So let's say I have six properties in Tucson. I'm not just looking at the data from my six properties, but the property management company own, uh, manages 50 properties. So I get all of that data as well. So um much more uh, upside to that, and I could I could minimize some of the downside, but there are some some potential hits that you've got to pay it really attention to, which is that that debt and those expenses because they can really affect the outcome of your deal. Yeah, one one more way that all people have been affected, but certainly anyone with the plan to go in and renovate a property and and try to get the big bucks after that. I mean, that's basically been the the business plan for the past four years or so. It seems like what I've seen is people buying distressed or older apartments, fixing them up, increasing rents, and then getting a huge payday when they sell. And their plan is to sell within three to five years or whatever. Um, I always looked at apartment investing as, oh, you buy an apartment, like you said, you've got these economies of scale, you've got increased cash flow, and it's a long-term hold. But that hasn't really been the case from the stuff I've seen, it's like in and out flipping these properties, the business plan, you know, called for all these expenses for CapEx, meaning, you know, the capital expenditures, what you have to do to improve that property in order to increase rents. And those costs have soared too. It's just like a triple whammy or quadruple whammy with all these things going on. So how has that affected you? And is that something people could have seen coming? I mean, obviously with a pandemic, we didn't see that coming, so you wouldn't know uh, that factories would be shut down and we wouldn't be able to get these materials. But yeah, how how has that affected you and, and yeah. others? Yeah, I think that's been less of, you know, because, you know, maybe it's going up 10 percent, 15 percent. That doesn't you can you can do less renovation. There, There's ways that you can work around that. But okay. when you have that on your insurance, there's no, no way around it. You need insurance. Yeah. You can't say I'm going to take half the insurance, you know. So, well, the bank requires uh, you to have the insurance. You right, have to have right. the insurance. So yeah. you've got to pay your real estate taxes. Yeah. You've got to pay your insurance. So on the on the capex side, so maybe you're not doing as many units. Maybe you're cutting down on that. And and for a lot of properties, particularly the last year, you're seeing a lot more occupancy on the unrenovated unrenovated units because people are are concerned about what they're paying for rent. So we haven't done a lot of renovations on our, on our, our unit interiors. Um, we've done it on the exterior and we're kind of, as rents have started to go back up again and we're not giving it um, concessions, we're going to start, you know, doing some more interior renovations and, and um, as they get renovated up, then, then we'll do a little bit more, a little bit more, but we'll, we'll tease it out. And so we, for a lot of them, we just haven't spent that money and, and the cost isn't isn't uh, 
uh, a killer because we all, we always put in a lot of buffers. I always recommend people, you know, because things break all the time. And so if you don't have buffers in there and, and for, for price increases or for things that uh, will break, then you're, then you're really in trouble. Yeah. Got to have those reserves, especially, you know, hundred X those reserves on, on a hundred unit multifamily. I've, I've seen a lot of people submit projects to us and it's like, where are the reserves? Um, but that makes a lot of sense that if somebody, you know, did a syndication with the business plan to have, I don't know how much, it was a million dollars set aside for renovations. And then all these things happened. You have that million dollars that could be spent, maybe not on the renovations, but just kind of keeping the project alive, being able to pay the insurance, being able to pay the increased costs. Uh, is that kind of what you're seeing for people who haven't had to do, for syndicators who haven't done the capital calls? Some can do that um, on more of the uh, the agency debt, but a lot of people went in these floating debt cases. And so that money um, for CapEx is, is borrowed um, from the lender. So even if I have the reserves, it might be, it might be a hundred thousand extra for roof, a hundred thousand for plumbing, a hundred thousand for electrical. That you know that that's not in my budget to spend, but just in case something breaks, but I've got to still borrow that from the lender. It's in that it's in that um, amount of money, so they can't necessarily use that for for paying uh, their mortgage debt or, or or whatnot. So some of it's flexible, some of it's not. Um, so and, and so every deal is a little bit different. Every every lender is a little bit different. Uh, how okay, because they they're they're the whole business plan that the lender saw too is no, you got to do these so that the values increase so that then yeah. we can you can get out of this debt and refi. Yeah. yeah, and then the bridge debt issue. A lot of uh, syndicators took bridge debt for those renovations. Is that what you kind of were referring to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, you know the lenders are you know much more on top of you. Or like, are you getting the rents that you predicted? based on those renovations um, and because they're feeling the heat because they're, they're having a lot of deals that, that uh, are in trouble. So they're much more on top of you. Your paperwork uh, is, is, is much more complicated uh, and they may push back on, on, on your business plan and say, Nope, we're not, we're cutting you off or, or, or whatnot. So um, it's a different environment. Yeah. Yeah. We had one lender um, cut off our, um, uh, our renovation budget and we you know we've been getting the return on investment they and the likely reasoning is that they must be hurting on other loans and wanted that that money mm -hmm. and uh, it's in the it's in the loan documents but um that they had the right to do that after a certain point but we're like we've certainly pushed back because it's it's hindering our our, our our business plan to some extent and we're like there's no reason for it because we're, we're hitting our numbers. We're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing. We're above pro forma, but because they're getting pain elsewhere, that it's affecting our execution. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Okay. That didn't want to quintuple whammy there. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it freaks me out, but it seems like, it seems like hopefully uh, there, there will be an opportunity to, or maybe there is now to get in. Um, you know, if, if all of this is, is causing values to go down such that all of these expenses would make sense. I mean, we've been waiting for that day. Has it come yet where values have come down enough? Yeah, things are definitely, um, you're seeing a 20 to 30% discount off the peak, um, which was, let's say mid 2022. So, uh, but deal flow is low. We bought one deal in 21 months. Um, we're certainly making some offers. Um, someone's has willing, uh, willing to pay more than us. And you're just like Tucson, there was 28 apartment buildings, a hundred units or more that sold in 2022. In 2023, there was only three deals, a hundred units or more. So a huge drop off. And that, that's just one market. So definitely a lack of, uh, of deal flow, but that's starting to kick up a little bit more um, and, and people are going to have to transact soon. Their loans are coming due. Um, you know, maybe it's, it's stressed because of their, um, uh, their mortgage that they have to pay. Um, 
So we're heading in the right direction. Rates are coming down, deal flow is going to pick up, and you're going to see some really good opportunities over the next uh, six months to a year until things potentially get frothy again. So how do you feel when certain politicians say that real estate investors are gouging tenants, given all everything we just said? Um, I, when we talked about supply and demand, we go, let's go back to that versus rent control. Let's incentivize people to build more so that we have the, a, let supply and demand work itself out and that'll bring rates down. Um, and for us, we've averaged over, um, I think it's 34.8 months, uh, a tenant to stay at our property versus the national average is like 27.5. We're increasing rents. We're creating value for residents. We're creating a better community. So they they want to stay in our properties and pay a little bit more because they're getting more. So it all depends what kind of value people are, are, are getting and they're willing to pay for it. So, um, But I, they've got to figure out a way to incentivize building versus the opposite, which is rent control. Yeah, rent control, given all these costs going up, is just a losing battle because people are going to get out of the business and there won't be, you know, just it, it, apartment investors aren't in it to uh, to lose money um, or to continue to lose money. Yeah. All right. So tell me, I look, we're running out of time, but tell me about your new book, Invest Smart. I think uh, the timing's great for this. Absolutely. Um, so it's about spotting red flags in real estate syndications. Um, I know... When I started investing in real estate syndications, I didn't know what to look for. Um, I didn't know about due diligence, getting to know the operator. So I jumped in on a deal. Luckily, it worked out okay. Um, but certainly, there were other deals that I uh, I kind of uh, shouldn't have invested in as well. And so it really is a great 101 for someone that wants to get into um, real estate syndications to, to make some passive investments and gives them a great framework uh, for them to how to look at a deal, how to look at an operator. And certainly they'll make better, more informed decisions. It doesn't guarantee them from making a mistake, nothing does. And and certainly the best operators have, have, have done bad deals uh, as well, but it will give someone um, some uh, really good uh, opportunities to, to know what to look for in, in real estate syndications. Awesome. And it's so funny because you reached out to me and said, I've got a new book. And I'm like, I have a new book. Mine is Scaling Smart. Yours is Invest Smart. I thought my next book will be Investing Smart, but you already took the title. <laughs> so you can find both of our books, Scaling Smart and Invest Smart, I'm assuming on Amazon. Yours is yep. there as well. Yep. Mine releases September 10th, but you can pre-order. And yours is already out? Uh, mine's coming out uh, Thursday, um, August uh, 29th. Awesome. Congratulations. It's too funny about the timing on that. All right. Well, let's just all be smarter huh? as we move forward. Yeah, lots of lessons learned over the last decade. All right, Gary, always a pleasure to speak with you. I'll be, I think, on stage with you in Denver soon. Yes, you get my in. Yep, yep. I will see you there. All right. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks again for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.